And he said, as a sting in the tail, from now on, no one will ever tell you the truth. <laughs> and you know, there's a lot in that, actually. When you actually acquire any sort of job that's eminent, how do you re remain normal, rooted, human, and so on? Well, the answer is marry a Scotswoman. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she has done the same, because she hates my Scottish jokes. Such as the one, <laughs> such as the one that goes, so what's the difference between a Scotsman and a coconut? And the answer is you can at least get a drink out of a coconut. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we didn't know very, very much about Detroit. Um, in my imagination, Detroit was a place of crumbling buildings, you know, sagging infrastructure, and decline of the motor industry. Um, I knew it, of course, as the home of Henry Ford, the birth of the motor industry. Joe Lewis, the boxer, who was quite a hero of mine when I was a young boy. But actually, in coming here, we realize there's more to Detroit than that. The Tigers, for example, <laughs> not a bad side, I understand. Oh, you look, you haven't given us any time whatsoever <laughs> to watch them. So you have to come back one day. Here, here, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's terrific to be part of your fellowship, because when we go home, you can be sure we'll be thinking of you and praying for you in the days ahead. I want to tell you, um, I want to actually say some interest, I think they're interesting in terms of what I imagine about Detroit. has given me an idea of what I, what I feel I want to say uh, in terms of how we should uh, be Christians today. We'll come to that in just a moment. But um, some years ago I heard the story of a group of women teachers, and uh, they wanted to know where they, how they're going to celebrate their anniversary, their 14 years together. So they decided they, that they would go to the Ocean View restaurant because the waiters were very handsome. Ten, ten years later, at the age of 50, the women discussed where they'd go for their anniversary, and they decided they would go same place, the Ocean View restaurant, because the waiters were very nice boys. <laughs> At the age of 60, they decided to discuss where they should go for their anniversary, and they decided that they would go to the Ocean View restaurant, because you could eat there in peace and quiet. <laughs> the restaurant had wonderful views, and the waiters were sweet boys. <laughs> Ten years later, at the age of 70, the women discussed where they should meet for their, their anniversary lunch. It was agreed they would meet at the Ocean View restaurant because the restaurant had very nice views. They had wheelchair ac access, <laughs> they even had an elevator, and the waiters were very helpful. Ten years later, at the age of 80, the women discussed where they should have their anniversary lunch, and they agreed that they should meet at the Ocean View restaurant because they'd never been there before. <laughs> <laughs> about Detroit, it reminded me actually that the church would always be a building site. There's always work going on. Um, it, it'll never be completed. That's the whole point. And it's a beautiful image that each one of us have a part to play. And I just want to mention three things very simply indeed. In fact, they begin with 
M's. First of all is to maintain our spiritual work with God, walk with God. Secondly, to mould our culture. And thirdly, always to remember that in some shape or form we're missionaries. And I just want to actually mention those very briefly indeed. And the first is to maintain our spiritual walk with God. I think you've got a fantastic church. It's a strong liturgy. Uh, yes, it may be high. It's, we call it high up the candle. And it's a pretty high up the candle. <laughs> and, and, and that's no bad thing. Because your worship last night, beautiful singing. Uh, everyone joining together. A lot of movement in that. But as well as our coming together, I, I want your church to be really strong. And with all the changes here, the building site imagery, you are on the cusp of something really interesting and really important. You're surrounded by this magnificent stadium and with people flocking in, and your presence there is so tangible and so important. So whatever happens, you're at the beginning of something which I think could be very exciting indeed. But each one of us has to play our own part. And what I'm finding in the United Kingdom is that many people are neglecting their own spiritual walk with God because they are so busy. Now I just want to say none of us should be so busy that we can't find time for God in our daily life. I want to suggest to you that if this speaks to you, try to find time. I think the best time is the beginning of the day. You know, it's a wonderful time. Even if you're a jogger and the younger people are, you can actually combine that with your own spiritual walk with God. You can always jog, pray, and so on. All of us will find that little space in our lives. Five minutes. We can always find five minutes or ten minutes at the beginning of the day. And that word discipline is so important. And you and I know that if you're keen on music, keen on learning a new language, you're never going to get any far, far with it unless you do it in a disciplined, daily way. And you find that as, the more you do it, the keener you are for it. It becomes part of your discipline. And sometimes, actually, we, we think that the normal thing that happens is that some people are luckier than others. But, you know, if you take a musician, you, they never rely upon luck. They never rely on, yes, I can do it because I played very well a month ago. I remember Jeff Hurst, who was one of our footballers in the 1966, when we won the World Cup, Jeff Hurst scored a hat-trick uh, that year. Mind you, that's the only thing we've won in recent years, and that's a long way back. You know, we're still trying to win the World Cup. And a young man came up to him one day and he said, You know, I actually believe that luck is a secret of everything. You're lucky if you get the right job, you're lucky if you do that. And Jeff first looked at him and he said, Well, young man, you, you've got a, an idea there. It's a, quite a, a point. But you know, I found in my life, but the harder I train, the luckier I become. Now there's something in that that's so important, as you train hard, then because you're trained, you're the athlete, yeah, okay, you score the goals. It's much more than luck. And the other thing I want to say in, in terms of maintaining our spiritual walk with God, you see the importance really of thanksgiving. I learned over the years, actually, if you start the day thanking God for all that he's done, for your beautiful family, success in your life, if you start with thanksgiving, what happens is it permeates your life. Because how can you be afraid if you've got a difficult interview, if you're worried about your, your child going into hospital? If you thank God, praise God, you know everything is going to work to that's my first end. The second is this, is to mould our culture. We have a, a joke in England, we all come from the same mould, only some are more mouldier than others. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
the idea of mold, I mean, the concept I have is that um, our culture all around us, do you know there's good and bad about it? Uh, the, the Anglicans, we Anglicans have always rejected the Puritan idea that the world is totally evil. We don't believe that. Because we know that God didn't create the world as an evil thing. He created it so that we could enjoy it and enjoy the good food and wines, uh, enjoy life, beauty, success, art, sport, all these kinds of things. But there is the darker side. And you and I can mould the culture in all kinds of different ways, like plasticine, working with our hands. At the moment, what is going on in the Middle East is a terrible, evil moulding of Western Middle East culture as um, IS sweep through and insist on women being hijabed, girls not going to school. That's an evil moulding of society. The good model of society is when you and I in our family life bring up our children to respect one another, love one another, uh, worship God, and all this kind of thing. And you and I, because many of you in front of me now, you're professional people, you have work to do, you and I, without knowing it, perhaps, or appreciating it very much indeed, we are molding our culture. You mothers, in your life, you're molding the lives of your children. And in 50, 60 years time, they're going to be the, the people you will be proud of. And this moulding of the culture is so important for our church. As I said, where you are situated is in a marvellous position. You're going to be there as a Christian congregation. When people are coming in, they're going to see the church, and it's going to be a visible sign of the presence of God with them. And that moulding of our culture should be going on in our lives uh, day by day. And I want to urge you to see life and what you're doing on the building site of what we call the Christian church. Simply helping to change things. I'm very proud that in our country, in Britain, it was William Wilberforce. He was a member of Parliament. It was through his efforts that slavery in Britain was done away with in the British Empire. I think you must be very proud of people like Martin Luther King, who at the age of 33, just 33, in that 33 years, changed and molded American society. You must be proud of that man. I think of other people in our country, in all kinds of ways of changed society. And each one of us has a really important role in doing that. My third M is that each one of us uh, are missionaries in some shape or form. And um, one of the things that's gone wrong in church life is that we've actually created a category called missionaries. And these are the people who go abroad and serve abroad. And that's a wonderful thing to do. But missionaries, actually, we're all missionaries. Day by day, we're a missionary. And I was saying to the the men in uh, Houston, Texas, just uh, a week ago, and I sent them a challenge, and I said, see today as an opportunity where you can be a missionary. Uh, it may come in all kinds of ways. A man might come up to you and he might say, well, you know, I've got a son, and my son is unemployed, he's very depressed about it, he's got a wife and young children, he's been looking for work for so long. And it's so easy for us to say, oh, yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. But if you probe a little, little, little more, deeper, and you said, um, well, um, I'll remember that. I'm a Christian. I'll, I'll pray for your son. If I find ways in which I can help your son find a job, I'll do my best to do so. And then you follow that up. In other words, you can see that being a missionary is a very ordinary thing. It's taking an interest in people and inviting them along to the Christian community. Do you know that a statistic was done in Britain just a few weeks ago and it showed in the Church of England newspaper place and on the headline was most Christians would not invite their non-Christian friends along to their own church. And I think that's terrible. 
Why shouldn't we be proud of our church? Uh, and we ought to be. Singing is great and so on. Lots of things going on for children and, and so on. We ought to be proud of our church. We would have no hesitation to say, come along and watch our local football team. Come along and watch the Tigers or whatever. And we ought to actually be prouder of our churches and, and, and to suggest to people that we can actually build the kingdom of God here on earth. So I want to suggest to you that we are all missionaries in some shape or form. One of the things that I recently, I read a book by Larry Seatentor called Inventing the Individual. It's an, an amazing, but it's a pretty intellectual book. But he makes a very important point. He says this, we often say in the Western world, in America, and in Europe, that actually it was the enlightenment from which we got our democratic rights and um, human values and so on. He argues in his book, no, we actually got it from the Christian faith. It was the church that gave us this. It was the, from the, the bosom of the church that our most important and precious values. Come. That's why I believe, you know, we ought to be much more uh, proud of the Christian faith. Because the Christian faith that shaped America, shaped England and Europe indeed, from these values of grown Western democracy, human rights, and the understanding of what we call the Judeo-Christian ethic. And that book, Inventing the Individual by Sarah Larry Seatendorf, is a very, very important thing indeed. So I want to uh, suggest to you that actually we ought to be really proud of the tradition uh, which is ours in Christianity, but also in the Episcopal Anglican tradition. Um, I said a very provocative thing to a men's group in Houston, Texas last week. I said, we must try to take religion out of Christianity. And one man after me said, well, what do you mean by that? What do you, you said, um, after all, Christianity is a religion, isn't it? And I said, yes, it is. But it's first and foremost a world view. It's a philosophy of life. It's far more than a religion. See, when you actually say, I'm Christian, you're actually saying, I believe in a world in which, in which God is a heavenly father. He cares for us. He loves us. He loves our world. And when it's only seen as a religion, people will turn their back on it, or some of it. If you see it as a philosophy of life, as a way of behaving in which God is our Heavenly Father, then it becomes a completely a different thing, indeed. So my friends, what I want to say to you this evening, and indeed have said, be hopeful about the future. I think that the evidence all around us is that when we actually approach the future with confidence and with faith, then, then there's so much uh, going for us. Now, I, I think you'll agree with me that um, Henry Ford, who I mentioned earlier, would not be, in your view, uh, known as a great theologian. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> but let me, let me read this. He said this, and I find this actually quite, quite remarkable. He said, I believe that God is managing the affairs, and he doesn't need any advice from me. With God in charge, I believe everything will work out for the best. So what is there to worry about. You see, when all is done and uh, uh, over, the, uh, the envelope, uh, envelopes that we'll, we will press will still be stationary. And by the same token, God is this, the same Heavenly Father who cares for us and loves us and will be with us the same yesterday and forever. So I want to say to you, let's press on and look up 
carry on enjoying this lovely meal, spend all your money on <laughs> and that Stephen will not allow you out of this room until so it's all gone. Thank you for listening to me this evening, and there's more to be said on Sunday, the first Sunday after the Ascension. So thank you very much indeed, and God bless you, and keep you. Thank you.